Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ancient Warfare Answers with me, Murray. Uh, this is a very special episode, uh, which is, of course, you can see in the descriptor saying it's number 300, which is crazy. Now, interestingly, number 300, I'm not going to be talking about the Battle of Thermopylae. <laughs> this, of course, is your weekly 10-minute fix of ancient military affairs uh, to take you away from whatever's happening in your actual life to think about not necessarily the Roman Empire, but uh, ancient warfare. And so you can, of course, ask us a question. That's what I do. I answer or I attempt to answer questions sent in by uh, listeners, viewers, people on the street. Uh, you can send us an email. You can comment on one of the previous podcasts or videos on YouTube. You can send us a postcard and you can ask us a question that's on your mind about ancient warfare. And I will do my best. Now, today's uh, 300th is tricky because... It's about a big one. It's what really happened at the Battle of Marathon. Wow. Okay. So any of those what really happens are tricky uh, because, of course, as historians, uh, we're, we're plagued by trying to decipher what happened 2,000 plus years ago using ancient sources, mostly in translation, but often you know we can use the Greek and the Latin of their originals, but they also are often writing much, much later. And the Battle of Marathon is no exception. Obviously, our best source for the Battle of Marathon is Herodotus, who's writing about 40, maybe 50 years later. The battle fought on the 10th of September, 490 BC. Um, and we have got various sources which give us that date to be able to specify. it. Now, as for what really happened, one of the issues, of course, with several other sources, Pausanias, uh, for instance, and Plutarch, they're writing in the second century AD, so five, six hundred years after the events they're describing. But in often times, they're the ones that survive and what, who they used as sources do not. So that's tricky. So we're dealing with a vast amount of time between the event and who we have describing it, which is often the problem vis-a-vis um, -vis the Iliad by Homer, for instance. Now, what we've got, therefore, at the Battle of Marathon is a whole range of things which cause historians conniptions. Now, the first uh, which causes conniptions is the numbers at Marathon, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but to give you a very quick background, September 490 BC, the Persian army lands in Marathon Bay, uh, which, of course, gives us the name of the Marathon because it's 42 point two kilometers from Athens, 26 miles, and the Athenians are essentially forced to march out and face this vast Persian army. Now, vast Persian army we'll get to in a minute. Uh, the reason for that is, multi well, there's actually multiple reasons. What we're told is it's punishment for the Athenians helping in the Ionian revolt, but it's also because the previous tyrants of Athens have been expelled in 510 BC, 20 years earlier, and that's Hippias. Uh, now, Hippias is from the deem of Marathon, so essentially landing with the uh, Persians, um, the commanders Datus and Artaphernes, landing with them at Marathon means that Hippias is landing in home territory where, where he would expect there to be support. Now, the idea, of course, is that the Persians want to burn uh, Athens, or especially the Acropolis, as punishment for the Athenians being involved in the burning of the temples of Sardis during the Ionian Revolt, uh, which, of course, doesn't happen in 490 BC, but does happen in 480 BC after the Battle of uh, Thermopylae and Artemisium. Now, what we've got is, therefore, the battle is important because it's it's sort of the moment of definition for Athens. It becomes the, the foundation moment where everything important grows from um, uh, the, the the marathon and the marathon generation. The other thing, of course, is that it's Athens almost alone, the Plataeans help, facing the Persians for the first time. So it's, you know, Greek hoplites versus Persian warriors for the first time in, in military history. Obviously, the Ionian Revolt, there have been fights. Uh, Miltiades, the Athenian general, has had experience of that, but, you know, not on home soil, shall we say. Now, the numbers. Herodotus, interestingly, does not give us the numbers for the Persians or the Greeks. Uh, the numbers come from three very disparate sources, uh, Cornelius, Nepos, Pausanias, and Plutarch. Now, 
they are interesting because Cornelius Nepos is writing uh, in the first century BC, whereas Pausanias and Plutarch are writing in the second century AD, so you know, two hundred something years after. Cornelius Nepos. Cornelius Nepos in his Life of Miltiades tells us that there are a thousand Plataeans who are added to the Athenians, which brings up the number to around 10,000, which gives us the idea that there's 9,000 Athenians and 1,000 Plataeans, 10,000 in total. Sometimes you'll find 10,000 Athenians and 1,000 Plataeans, but that doesn't seem to be what those sources say. But, but finding them isn't a matter of going to the main narratives, for instance. Now, the other one, um, the Plutarch is, um, reading my Plutarch blurb here, uh, taking advantage of the book collection behind me, Plutarch's uh, Greek and Roman parallel stories is is problematic, shall we say. It's a it's a it's uh, one of the moralia, and it has all sorts of historians that we have no record of anywhere else except this obscure little work of Plutarch's. And there's been all sorts of debate about whether we accept it or not. Now, the interesting thing here is that basically what Plutarch gives us is a number of 300,000 for the Persians. We'll come to that number um, and the reason it's a problem uh, in a minute. But he says the Athenians, however, contem contemning, contemning the barbarian host opposing, the barbarian host sent out 9,000 men. And then he gives us a problematic issue of naming four generals, which is not the case uh, in Herodotus. In Herodotus, we get... 10 generals, the Stratagoi, and the Polemarch, uh, Callimachus. So that is another problem which we probably need to deal with in a different uh, podcast because 10 minutes isn't long enough. Now, what you then got is the issue of, and then Pausanias, sorry, the other source about the numbers. Pausanias's book 10 talks about not more than 9,000 Athenians marched to Marathon. So across those three, we seem to have corroboration that there's 9,000 Athenians, 1,000 Plataeans, bringing the number up to around 10,000. They face 300,000 Persians, according to Plutarch, which no modern source, no modern author accepts those numbers. Now, we do get a number in Herodotus of the number of fallen at the Battle of Marathon, which is interesting because he tells us 192 Athenians die. Now, 192 is the number of figures on the uh, Panathenaic frieze of the Parthenon. Perhaps it is a um, commemoration of, of the war dead, which is interesting in itself. But again, another podcast. But there's 6,400 Persian dead. Now, that means for every Athenian, 33 Persians die, uh, which is, you know, how how brilliant the, the Athenians and Plataeans are. But uh, that is, of course, problematic. No one accepts that number. It gets reduced down to a much smaller number. But it, the funny thing about that is that there's a great deal of ink spilt over it. I think, though, that it's interesting because Herodotus tells us 600 triremes are, is the, the Persian fleet. Now, if you take a number of warriors per trireme at, at between 30 and 40 men, uh, warriors as opposed to rowers, that gives you an army of between eighteen and 24,000 Persians. Now, that, ironically enough, comes down to the number that a lot of modern sources want to reduce the Persian army to, uh, but it does so with a kind of a logical step. And it also means that the Athenians and the Plataeans are still outnumbered two to one, uh, which makes their victory still remarkable. Not as remarkable as 10,000 uh, Greeks defeating 300,000 Persians, which we get repeated in Herodotus's account of, of the actual discrepancy in numbers, but we've talked before about numbers. Now, the other, no, 300,000 is not the biggest number. We get Justin, gives us 600,000. Simonides uh, gives their number as 90,000. Um, and, you know, everything in between. However, um, I think around about 24,000 is a good maximum, but it still massively outnumbers the, the Greeks. What you then get is the idea that the Persians land, as I say, in Hippias's home territory. The Athenians march out. Um, they send out runners. Pheidippides is the name that um, most people give us, but there are other names. And only the Plataeans answer the call. There's various different excuses from the other Greeks, none of their business. Uh, the Spartans have a, a religious uh, sort of ceremony to ritual to, to enact, and therefore they don't come out straight away. They come later and see the battlefield and then march home. But what we then get is the idea of a wait at Marathon, that the, the Athenians encamp, the Persians camp, and then there's a wait. And how long is the wait? 
Now, the interesting thing about the weight is there's various solutions about the weight. One is that the idea later is that the 10 strategoi of the Athenian army are command on a daily rotation. And the one general who has experience of the Persians is Miltiades, and therefore they wait for his day. Now, Herodotus has an odd combination of that story with another explanation of the weight, that they're waiting for Spartan help. Now, there's also a problem in the sense that there's the 10 strategoi, Miltiades' day to be in command, and Callimachus, the, the polemarch. Now, the problem there is that the polemarch seems to be the older formation of the Athenian army, as opposed to the strategoi, which is the later. So there's sort of a, a transitional period, perhaps, of the uh, military reforms at Athens, which which might explain it, but it might just be that Herodotus has got it confused. So what we therefore have is this uh, idea that the uh, Athenians wait. Possibly the Persians are not moving either because they are waiting for the Athenians to surrender. Uh, and that's the expectation, and that's not happening. Uh, the, the, the other big problem with the Battle of Marathon, of course, is that the uh, Persian cavalry are nowhere to be found in the battle accounts. Uh, and Pausanias tells us later that there's the ghosts of horses on the battlefield, but Herodotus doesn't include cavalry anywhere in his account. And that's been explained in a variety of ways, most commonly that the Persian cavalry are away foraging. That's nowhere in any ancient source. They're just not in the battle account, and we don't know why. So that's a problem in terms of what really happened, because uh, we can suggest various explanations, but no ancient source really gives us uh, the answer. Plutarch talks about the Athenians felling trees to stop the cavalry, outflanking the, the, the Athenian phalanx, but that's pretty as, as close as we get to the idea that they're a cavalry. Uh, but of course, cavalry aren't, aren't charging cavalry. They're not, they're not charging home into, into infantry. They're, they're sort of uh, scouting skirmishing and horse archer cavalry, but they're still not mentioned in the battle accounts. Uh, the Stoa Poikile apparently had horses on it, so there seems to be a, a tradition that there were cavalry, but it's not in Herodotus's account or the other versions of the battle explicitly problematic. Anyway, uh, so that's really a, a big problem for what happened, what really happened at the Battle of Marathon. The next issue with the Battle of Marathon is the Athenians draw up. I've, I've written in the Ancient Warfare blog about how they drew up and how interesting that is. Um, you know, the, the Athenian army is, is 10 tribal tax ace, and the call out for the Battle of Marathon seems to be everybody, uh, young, old, uh, everyone available. So it's the, uh, the, the the whole call out. Then probably, therefore, Callimachus is on the right. That's the position of honour. Uh, the Plataeans are on the left. That's the position of honour for the, the, the allies, and they're the only allies present. Um, so that seems to be something we can sort of extrapolate. Now, uh, they then run at the Persians, uh, not less than a mile away, is we, what we're told by uh, Herodotus. That is also explained that the run is to limit the effect of the archery of the Persians. Uh, possibly Miltiades' idea, um, who's seen them in action, knows that the Persians are an archery force. The idea, of course, that the, per the, the Persians are less well-armoured than the Greeks, and therefore the Greeks are able to survive that run because of their armour and their shields, their Aspides shields. Uh, whatever the case, we then get the idea that the Athenians run at the Persians who are shocked. No one's ever run at them before. They've always run away. <laughs> and so that's sort of the first, you know, the Herodotus says that it's the first time that an enemy looked upon the Persians and did not know fear. Uh, fabulous, epic moments. Now, we then get this idea that the, the wings are packed, um, which is the very vague phrase of Herodotus, and that the Athenians and the Plataeans are victorious on the wings, but they're beaten in the center. Now, in normal hoplite battle, that's a disaster. If your line breaks in the center, uh, it's all over. But what seems to happen is the two wings of the Athenian army are successful. They defeat the men opposing them who start to run back towards the uh, ships 
on the uh, the northern end of the the Marathon Bay, and then in the centre, the Athenians are destroyed and what defeated, and that's probably where most of those casualties uh, occur. Now, again, 192 out of 9,000 is not bad in in casualty terms. Uh, the wings then seem to join together, so they they envelop, turn in, and then defeat the centre, and then the whole remaining Athenian force charges for the for the ships, which is where there's a battle at the ships, parallels the Iliad slightly at that point. where And that's where Callimachus dies. Um, and uh, Kynagiris also dies, one of the Athenian heroes of the battle, and probably one of the commanders, uh, along with Miltades. Now, in that sense, it's a, it's a straightforward, but the actual level of coordination, communication between the Athenian left and right wing uh, is remarkable. And it can't have been premeditated that, that they would allow their centre to break. That's 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 anathema to hoplite phalanx warfare. So it seems to be a remarkable decision that they can communicate with one another, that they're going to march together having defeated the wings. I mean, it's it's possible to envisage it in the sense that this is all head height battle that we're not dealing with, uh, you know, it's a flat plane. Uh, it's not It's not terrain that, that uh, blocks sight. It's also not, I mean, yes, it's loud. There's screaming and yelling and there is, uh, uh, you know, weapons clashing, but it's not It's not loud in a, in a filmic uh, modern Hollywood sense where there's explosions. Even in ancient battle, there's explosions. There's fire everywhere in ancient battles, which there's not. So there must have been some way that the Athenians could communicate to say, right, stay, you know, don't pursue the fleeing enemy, stay where you are, left turn or right turn, come to the centre, rescue the men in the centre. So it's a really interesting aspect of it, but that's what I think happens. Uh, and then they pursue the Persians back to the ships, the Persians get back on the ships, the Athenians capture some ships, and then the next interesting thing about the the battle, of course, is the idea that there's a signal, the uh, Athenian family are blamed, uh, and there's a whole passage on whether it was a, a you know traitor in the midst. Now, the interesting thing with that, of course, is that the Persians are on their ships. They're going to have to sail around Attica to get back to Athens, and the Athenians, of course, uh, having sent their runner home to Athens to say they're victorious, he dies the first marathon. Uh, the army march back, and so that when the Persian fleet enters uh, the harbour, they see the Athenian army standing there waiting that's that's the thing but i think that the the main what happened at marathon is very much about uh all those things about numbers the run the charge and the the battle being defeated so uh there i've doubled my time and talked for 20 minutes not not <laughs> not 10 uh but hopefully that tells you something about what i think really happened at the battle of marathon and you can join me again next time for another ancient warfare answers thank you 